we would like to welcome our Sustainable Landscape Maintenance Practices panel to the stage. Timothy Salin is a co-CEO of IMG Enterprises, the holding company of Cherry Lake, Inc. IMG Enterprises is a second-generation, family-owned Florida agriculture company that manages over 13,000 acres throughout the state. The enterprise has diversified operations in citrus, environmental restoration, horticultural production, as well as landscape construction, irrigation, and maintenance. Mark Singleton is the Territory Manager and Soil Ecosystem Restoration Specialist for Life Soils. He works with the Life Soils team to encourage developers, builders, and landscape installation contractors to consider soil health as a vital component of the design and installation process. With over 14 years in the industry, Mark is extremely passionate about protecting the natural resources of Florida as population growth drives further development throughout the state he loves. David Ressler is the outsourcing and curbside leader at Cherry Lake, an integrated environmental horticulture and landscape company in Central Florida. David is a certified arborist, Florida licensed irrigation contractor, and FNGLA certified landscape contractor. James Dyer is a landscape and irrigation construction project manager at Cherry Lake. James has worked on many high profile projects for clients such as Walt Disney World, including integrated project delivery, IPD projects. Jimmy Rogers is part of the sustainable landscaping team at Cherry Lake, where he provides strategic oversight of the farm landscape management, taking phased steps towards greater sustainability through Florida native plants. Jimmy has knowledge and passion about creating native and sustainable landscapes that inspire others. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, very happy to have this opportunity to talk about landscape maintenance because as we get into uh, these opportunities to create and design and install these sustainable landscapes, we were really challenged with the very important requirement of maintaining them. So this topic, I think, will be uh, an interesting continuation of, of what we've, we've talked about so far. Just want to point out, unfortunately, Mark Singleton uh, can't be here today, uh, so we're going we're gonna to do the panel without him. Um, but we have a great uh, group of professionals here who have a lot of experience in landscape maintenance uh, from a lot of different uh, perspectives. And we want to share our thoughts on how we might maintain these sustainable and mostly native landscapes and what types of skills are going to be required of our landscape industry professionals moving forwards in order for us to do this at scale to support a developer such as Tavistock who wants to do these landscapes on 24,000 acres and other developers uh, who have uh, indicated that they want to follow in, in those footsteps and do it as well. So um, as I mentioned, we, we have uh, 10 goals and you can see through the, the presentations that have happened so far, we're, we're working on many of these goals and we're seeing a lot of progress. Uh, one of those goals is to increase the industry capabilities and competencies around sustainable landscaping maintenance because it's not the same as conventional maintenance. And we know a little bit about that at Cherry Lake because we have a conventional landscape maintenance business that does conventional landscape maintenance for large HOAs and apartment complexes and, and resorts. And as much as I would love to do a lot of sustainable landscape maintenance, uh, so far, and uh, the market has not been for that. It has been for turf grass dominated St. Augustine landscapes with a lot of viburnum orticums, the lord petalums, Indian hawthorns, trinets, ligustrums, crepe myrtles, and, and that's what we do. And whether it's us or, or anyone else, we're all kind of approaching it the same way. We show up with a big truck and a big trailer and, and four or five guys jump out and they open the back of that truck and here come the mowers and the blowers and the edgers and the trimmers and, and off we go. And, and this is the work that we do. These are the tools that we use. And as a result, those are the skills and aptitudes that our professionals have. So where is this truck 
trailer, equipment, and what are these guys going to do when they show up here? <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I think they're going to look around and they're going to say, geez, I think we showed up with the wrong set of tools. <laughs> so it's not, it's not the same. And, and that's what we want to talk about. How, how is it different? And what is it that we're going to need to be successful? Um, we saw the model homes at Sunbridge. Uh, this is a beautiful landscape that Dix Height designed. I think it's Oviedo on the park. Is that right? Um, same thing. You know, you show up with that truck, um, you're, you're, you need a different approach. So, um, you know, this is some of our, our people. That's Andreas um, on the left. <laughs> That's me with one of our crews. Um, on the right, great guys. You know, they, they, they're here to work. Um, they they want to be uh, they want to be successful at what they do, and um, we need to help take them on a journey from landscaper to gardener, and help them acquire those skills that are needed on these landscapes. And frankly, I think it's rather urgent because we will fail if we are not able to follow up on the good work that's been done to get us to this point and maintain these landscapes successfully. It's very easy to show up. You don't know what you're looking at. You can't mow it, so you rip it all out. You know, <laughs> you, know you don't know what that plan is. It looks like a weed, maybe, I don't know. What is it? I'll just take it out and you know, sell somebody an enhancement, and you know, they just bought a bunch of trinets and lower pedalum. So, so we, gotta, we don't want that to happen. So we, we definitely need to do something to, to get the, the, the industry going. So, I'm going to show a few videos that spread throughout this presentation because one of the things that we've been working on is a video um, series for training on, uh, on the types of skills and best practices we think are going to be helpful. And we kind of keep the videos short. They're like one to three minutes long so that you know, we can make them available to a homeowner or a landscape professional. And we're going to try to chop them up into topics that will address the various skills and, and uh, tools that are needed in landscape maintenance for sustainable landscapes. And also some, some of these videos kind of talk about general principles, which um, this first one I'll play for you guys. So the point of this video is to talk about how we are going to make a series of videos that you can learn and follow along as we go into using and learning the work with native plants more on projects, houses, and subdivisions. The biggest thing is, as you already know a lot of natives, they're just used in ornamental landscapes. So you'll be surprised when you get to some of these jobs that are almost dominated by the native plantings that you'll know a large chunk of them already. So we'll post a few of them on the, over my shoulder here so that you'll start being familiar with them. But the biggest thing is, is that when you're on a natural native planting site, we're not gonna maintain everything as you would. Thought was put into where these plants are planted, right place for the right plant. So we want them to grow to their potential. There may be a few that have to get cut back, but we'll do that in the fall or in the early spring. Most of the time, you're going to wind up using your hand printers, if any pruning at all. Most of the jobs have been designed so that all you, the main concerns are that, the, that you don't overwater and that you're weeding. Those are the two things we want to watch the most. We don't want ever want the weeds to get out of control, and we want to make sure that natives are not getting too much water. Natives do not like a lot of overhead irrigation once they're established, and that's just there to supplement them through the hard times after establishment, period. One thing that's really good about natives is it's gonna help us save water in Florida. And that's what we're, the, one of the biggest points we're trying to do with this. Um, weed prevention and control, that's gonna happen through mulching. So a good layer of mulch, preferably gonna be pine straw that's gonna to have to be applied a couple times a year. But we wanna make sure it's thick enough that it's gonna prevent that seed from germinating. But it's also gonna keep the moisture in the ground as well, especially if you're working in an area on the sand hill where moisture retention is very important and the grounds are gonna perk a lot. Um, one of the other things that we will work with in, with people and there'll be more videos coming about it is fall cutback. And that's gonna happen in the spring or late fall. And that's where perennial plants and, other, and some hedge materials, depending on where they're planted, will be trimmed down all the way to the ground, partially to the ground, it depends on the species. And we have, we'll have a series about how to maintain 
each one of those plants moving forward. Some of them will be in the next few series you'll see during this training. But pay attention, and the biggest thing is, don't be afraid to ask questions. If you're not sure how to maintain a plant on a property, please stop and ask your supervisor. If he doesn't know the answer, then call the next person above, because we do not want to do something where we cut back something too hard at the wrong time of the year, and it takes away from that plant's growth, health, or the presentation that we were trying to provide for it to be in that landscape. Thank you. So this is um, one of, of many videos that we intend to produce. We have our first batch that's already uh, published on the Outside Collab YouTube channel, and we'll talk more about that as we go through. But um, we want to start this conversation by kind of looking at conventional landscape maintenance model and understanding really what, what's going into the, uh, the maintenance of our conventional landscapes and, and how are we spending our time and money. So you want to talk us through a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, I worked for one of the major landscape uh, companies here in Central Florida. We actually maintain this building. And, you know, when you sit down and you figure out, you know, where do my resources go? You know, a truck leaves a yard, it's an F-250, there's six guys in there, two or three mowers on it, two cycle equipment. <laughs> then you observe, you know, where are the resources being spent. And it kind of depends a little bit on the property type. So a higher end properties versus lower end properties in the sense that, you know, the typical um, HOA community, you spend the bulk of your time mowing. That's really what your activity is. I had one of my... Uh, 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 colleagues once tell me, you know, it's really simple here. We just mow grass. Don't, don't make it complicated. That's what we do is we mow grass. And he's really right. That's what we did. We mowed grass, and then we cleaned up what we mowed, and then we moved on. So really, most all of our activities are centered around that grass mowing activity, and it's not really a value add, right, because there's not a lot of time to prune the shrubs, not a lot of time to do much of anything else other than get the grass mowed, get back in the truck and go to the next stop. So this is, a, we call it a B property, so that would yeah. be like a middle of the road commercial property. So we have, we have the same charts for A and C property. So an A property would be... Like a resort property. And when I look at a resort property, there's a lot more hand pruning there. There's a lot more special care plants, more similar to what you would have in a native landscape planting. So it kind of also changes the demographic of who's doing the work. Uh, when I said men, it really was men in the trucks. There was 106 uh, men in the branch, and that was all men in the, in the trucks because you're carrying around a heavy, lot of heavy equipment. It's a lot of heavy work, you know, to get the... But in the resort side, we were able to employ a lot of women, which really was a, nice because it gave us a bigger work pool to pull from. And those individuals did a great job of taking good care of the landscape and much more attention to detail. So it allowed us to have a, a different, more diverse workforce. So I thought that was a, a big positive for us. But it was kind of uh, amazing how much time on the... C property, which would be a, a property that was kind of unirrigated bahia grass, it's just all mowing. That's, that's really what the people expect you to do is, hey, it's been, you know, 10 days and I haven't seen you mow yet. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what the job consisted of. It was really more of, uh, you know, manpower management and equipment management. There was very little horticulture. I have a horticultural background, but there was very little opportunity to do much with it. You, know, you go in and say, hey, I want to, you know, try a different kind of product, of, you know, a different type of, uh, you know, oil or spray and something less aggressive, but there's really no room for that. You're here to mow the grass and you, your clients make you really aware of the fact that's what your job is. <laughs> if, you, if you ever forget it for a second, you're, you're reminded that, hey, your job is to mow the grass. Get, 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 get somebody back on that more. you know, so. So, yeah, we're, and, and what we're finding is that not only are we putting a lot of labor out there, the labor is primarily dedicated to taking care of the turf, but we're, we're caught in an industry structure where we're really competing for very thin margins. And that's true, you know, so what happens is, is that since the landscape maintenance bids are out there on the street, you know, and a lot of account managers move from place to place, everybody knows the number. You know, everybody knows the number of this property who wants to bid on it. So what they do to win the bid is they just drop the price a little bit less. So what we've done is we've kind of collapsed to the point where it's no one's fault. It's not one landscape maintenance company's fault. It's not the owner of this property's fault because they can't really go to the ownership and say, hey, we want a 35% increase in maintenance next year because somebody came in and said we're not maintaining correctly. They have five bids in their hands right now, at, like these guys sitting on the bench talking about, you know, who won the bid. And it's a race to the bottom, and it, it's really hard to break that cycle. And then on top of that, when you look at the inputs, when you have to go mow, that's a Ford F-250 going down the road, right? So it's a big truck, usually a diesel truck. You got all the equipment on the back. So everything's kind of built around that one activity. 
So there's so much waste in that. And then when you get to the job site, there's another group of waste, which is, you know, six guys bail out of the truck and it's all, hey, once we get it mowed, we got to get it cleaned up and they get back in and that's it. That's, that's what you, so it's really unfortunate for everybody involved. Nobody's winning the, the game, right? The, the company who's do, providing the service doesn't win. The building owner doesn't win. The employee doesn't win. It's kind of a, a lose-lose all across the board. Yeah, it's, it's a tough industry, and I think that as we reimagine the landscape, we, we also need to reimagine the, the maintenance industry. This is an opportunity to provide more meaningful jobs, to provide hopefully better wages, and to provide a, um, an activity that is going to create more value all around, not just for the, the, the property owners, but the employees of the landscape companies and, and the environment. So. Uh, we're going to watch a, another video. I want to just kind of pepper these in to give you guys uh, some samples of, of what we're creating. Hi, this is Jimmy from Cherry Lake. Today we're talking about the right plant in the right place. And we're giving a couple examples here with the wild poppy as an example. This is planted here because we're in a full shade situation underneath a really big live oak. And it comes over the building and it really gets very little sun. So this plant's a really good one for that. It's planted on proper plant spacing. And then when it tops out, it'll be roughly right around the bottom of these windows. So it'll just require minimal pruning throughout the year just to keep it in shape. But it's really going to work out a lot less maintenance than if we had a typical ornamental hedge and we'd have to continuous prune. Also, we have Marlberry here, which really likes full shade. Blooming well here, it's liking where it's at, and it was planted well away from the wall, so it has room to, to get wide like it does at the bottom. But it's also going to help break up the space between the two windows and just, you know, add a little bit of architectural feature to the house, to the plant. Yeah, so short videos. Um, that one was more on, on a little bit right place, right plant. Um, a lot of our videos are going to be more technical training, but we wanted to talk about that because um, a lot of our success in maintenance is going to be set up and determined by the, the design in the first place. Um, there are a lot of things that, that we control uh, when we get on site as uh, landscape maintenance professionals, and we can do what we can to optimize that process. But a lot of it is also kind of determined for us in advance by the choices that are made in design. So we thought we would take a moment before we get into the, the maintenance practices themselves and just suggest uh, some of the top design strategies for optimizing you know, your maintenance down the road. Um, so the first one we picked is proper plant spacing, uh, allowing those plants to reach their, their mature habits. So I know, James, you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, when we're looking at the design, you know, we, Everybody comes to Florida and they look at these lush, you know, full green landscapes. They look at Disney and Universal and hey, that's what I want in my yard, but it's not sustainable. I mean, we're jamming plants into an area that doesn't give them the room to mature. So, you know, they're competing for nutrients, competing for water, competing for air. Then you have, you know, pests and, you know, fungus and all sorts of diseases that you're competing with, where if we would just space them out a little bit, let them be what they want to be, mature on their own, they'll be a much stronger, healthier plant and able to fight those things off naturally. So that's kind of what we need to look at when we look at spacing is, you know, how big does it want to be, you know, and educate our customers and say, hey, when it's installed, it's going to be this, knowing that, you know, this is what it will turn into. And, you know, you need to be willing to accept this and let it mature. And, you know, just like your children, you want your children to grow up, right? So the plants need to grow up too. And it's going to save us time on, on, and maintenance, right, Jimmy? Because there's a lot of stuff we're not going to have to do. It is, and it's also going to provide, I mean, you can use your post-emergent herbicides. If you don't choose the hand weed, it gives you the space to do that. You, you know, what's was interesting when you're in the landscape maintenance business, you're trying to train your crews. You try to always train your crews, hey, not everything's a square box. But it's really hard to break that. And, you know, to your point, as you space things out, I think the crew will instantly see, hey, this is going to be its own plant with its own shape. I remember, you know, Kunti plants, they would come and just make square boxes out of those too. So anything yeah. they saw, they'd make a square box because that's how they're programmed. So we got to reprogram the workforce to yep. go into that mode, which is, hey, this is a separate plant. It has individual character, individual look. It needs to be hand pruned. But I think the inputs aren't as much because you're not doing all of that pruning over and over again. So it's, it's a little different. Yeah, and then, you know, it affects your cost as well because, okay, you're going to use less plants in an area. But, you know, that may be a higher 
cost plant to begin with, so it'll offset it. Maybe plant a bigger plant or... Yep. And yeah, and the, the, pruning, the, the pruning is a major cost, as you guys saw from the, the pie charts. We, we have to go in there and, and prune and hedge. So if we set it up so that the plants really don't require pruning, we've just saved ourselves you know, over the entire life cycle of, of the project. Not to mention the stress that we're, we're creating on these plants every time we, we do that to them. Um, this has been talked about a lot, um, right, right tree, right place, but it bears repeating because if we're, we're dealing with uh, this in the landscape, we're, we're fighting a losing battle. Yeah, I mean, you know, you look at the right tree, right place, it's more than, you know, what is the utilities overhead or around you? It's it, cramming a oak tree between a sidewalk and curb where you've only got three feet, knowing that where are the roots going to go? They're going to upheave the sidewalk, upheave the road. So, it's, you know, are there other trees we can use in that aspect? And, and thinking about that as we go around the building, the structure, how big is that tree going to get? What space does it need? What space do the roots need? Um, will the building, you know, shade out the tree and cause issues there? And then on top of that, we have to look at what is going under those trees because we know we have leaf drop and oaks is a good one because you have acidic leaves and acidic soils and we always struggle to find things to plant under them. You know, everybody wants to put some St. Augustine sod there and it doesn't grow. So it's understanding, you know, what do you want your landscape to look like and picking the right tree for that. So it's, you know, in the planning part, you know, getting with the customer, what, is, what do you want to use this space for? Pick the right tree for that space that will have the best chance of survival no, and also that won't cause issues with the plantings around it. Okay, so, and this should have been a, like a family feud question, like, you know, what are the top design strategies for reducing long-term maintenance costs? <laughs> but number three, <laughs> survey says, uh, utilize more dwarf and slow growing varieties. And, and this might be a challenge because my earpiece fell. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, they're not necessarily available always, but if you can find them, uh, what are some of the benefits that you see, Jimmy, with, with this approach? Well, we're using the dwarf varieties. They're just, you can, they're going to fit in a better places at work within around your buildings and things like that. So you're getting the benefit of the full size. It's just compact. So some of them, say like the, the um, viburnums, they're going to still produce their berries. They're going to produce, produce the food for the birds, but you're still going to be able to fit them under your windows, like with the Miss Schillers or something like that. The Darrowi are going to work. The blueberries are going to work in an area for like we used on some of the buildings at uh, Westland as entrance hedges around foundation. The coffee is excellent because it works. You can get a cut. There's three or four different varieties, and the dwarf ones will work under hedges in full shade. That video, the audio was a little hard, but you could understand it was just it's going to work in full shade in front of the house, block the foundation, create a backdrop for the rest of the landscape, but it's going to thrive there. It's going to be shiny. That bright leaf really does brighten up an area, even though it is green. So there's a lot of things that um, landscape architects can use the dwarf varieties for. We just got to get the growers to grow them. Yes, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> so number four, um, we recommend let's, let's identify some of our you know, maintenance problems and try to reduce or eliminate high maintenance items. And I know, David, you were struggling with this out there in the field a lot. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of plants that the, the more you prune them, the more they're going to produce more vegetative growth. So when you get certain plants on a, on a job site, I remember our branch, we had a, a bill of 100000 plus a year in just green waste disposal. So that was just to have somebody come and pick up the clippings that we took off of the plants to bring to the branch in the truck to then get back out again. So you think about that waste, it's kind of right. So we're putting out fertilizer, we're putting out water, we're doing all this work to produce this stuff that then we can cut off, bring back home, and pay another guy to haul off. There's zero added value for anybody in, in, that, in that whole process. But then you use a plant like a little John bottle brush in the right place, you know, you're, you're not taking a lot of material off that plant for a very long time. And when I looked at a project, when you bid them and you see those kind of plants on there, you know that, hey, I'm going to have a lot less labor input. I'm going to have less waste taken back off of my projects. It's just all around. It's, it's better for the, for the total environment. A lot of talk has gone into this, this uh, couple of days. So, you know, obviously we want to reduce and eliminate turf for the very reason that that is driving most of our labor and costs in a conventional landscape. 
Um, so you guys saw a lot of examples of how we can do that and some of the plants that we're, we're using. But frankly, we still have a lot to learn in terms of which you know, ground covers we can use and, and maybe find new and innovative ways of growing and utilizing ground covers. So um, that's still an area to grow. Um, yeah, we're doing a lot of trials at the farm now with multiple varieties. Um, we have plans to do even more. It's, you know, you're still going to have weeds, so it's how do we control the weeds, what can we use to treat them when we need to, and, you know, you're, there's certain ones you can't treat anything with that we found so far, so it's, you know, trying to weed, weed those out and, and find the ones that we can use and will be sustainable and, and a, a decent alternative to sod. Okay, so, you know, this is a... Uh, one that turns out I think does have an impact on your maintenance costs is you know how you mulch and how you re renew mulch can be pretty expensive in a landscape process so uh, we feel pine straw is is the way to go yeah I mean with the the pine straw I mean it's providing it's beneficial to the plants in the soil right as it breaks down and it breaks down quickly so you're not ending up with this huge layer of mulch like you do with pine bark that doesn't go anywhere unless it rains and it floats away, right? So, and that's the other thing about pine straw is when you put it down and it knit it, knits, it stays there. So it works well on slopes to help with erosion as well. So, you know, we're using mulch to try and control weeds popping up through it and to try and hold the moisture in the soil, but it's more than that, right? Yeah, pine straw is a renewable resource. So, I mean, we're not having to cut a tree down to get it. So it's harvested, it's a byproduct basically of the forestry department or the tree farms they call them. So they're harvesting that pine straw, we're utilizing it there. It also adds a second thing, if you use products like live soil which feed off the fungal, feed off of carbon based stuff, you're actually feeding the compost that was put down originally. So you get into that food, you know, that food web for the, for the soil and that's where things really start happening. I mean, because that's when you start, if you start adding a bunch of synthetics into that, that's when you break it back down again. But if you keep using the renewable resources, composting, using organic mulches, it's going to keep feeding that, which is going to help your plants, make them stronger, and you're not buying chemicals. You know, one thing I was kind of surprised about is, you know, in the landscape maintenance, the traditional landscape maintenance industry, the mulch isn't serving any function other to make it look new. It's just kind of like a, a little touch-up, right? So you'd have the clients call up, hey, I need you to touch the mulch up before the holidays, and you're out there putting in the mulch, knowing the fact that they probably don't have the budget to remove it, because it's not going to go on its own. You're thinking the whole time, you know, there's, you're not adding anything that's positive to the landscape, putting this, other than some aesthetics. And the aesthetics, you know, kind of depends on the, who's looking at it, but to me, it was unbelievable to spend, you know, that kind of capital to just give it a little better look, but it, it didn't benefit the plants. It actually hurts the plants because it builds up a mulch layer if you don't budget to remove it. It's just, it's a, kind of a broken system, and I don't know if everybody really thinks of the why am I putting the mulch out. You know, the real why I'm putting it out, to me, doesn't really justify the, well, the expense. That's, that's why the pine straw is nice, because you're going to do it more often, so you'll get that fresh look because it's degrading faster. Yeah, and you're adding the, the why because you're putting some organics into the soil, so there's a benefit to the, the plant. You're holding down the moisture, you're keeping weeds down, so you're kind of adding. And then our, our last uh, uh, tip, and this is more relating to the installation, because um, we can really get ahead of the, the weed pressure if we use the right pre-emergence in the right way. Um, as was discussed, weeding can be a challenge, especially during the establishment before your, your selected plants have a chance to fill in and, and cover ground. Um, so this is Sunbridge, and James, your team installed the, uh, the research plots. What did you guys do on the pre-emergent side? Yeah, so for that site, we used a liquid, and it's a mix of Ronstar and, uh, or I'm sorry, Ronstar, I'm sorry, Pennant and Gallery are the two chemicals we mixed. Um, so it's liquid, backpack sprayer, get all the plants in, spray it down, and then apply the mulch. The key with pre-emergence is, you know, when you put it down, making sure you don't have a lot of foot traffic through there before you get the mulch down, because all you're going to do is disturb it, disturb it, and making sure that you're picking the right one for your site and the plants, right? So those two chemicals worked well for that site. And what we're doing is we're suppressing any weed growth while we're establishing the plants to give them a head start, allow them to become healthy and strong. And that way they can naturally fight off the weeds later on. 
And Jimmy's been out there maintaining it. He can kind of elaborate on what he's seen over the, what, since March? It has. Usually a lot of pre-emergence, you usually want to come back with it every 90 days if you get on a rotation. But we haven't had to readdress it there on that pl on the plots at all. I've been able to keep up with that with a weekly weeding. You know, Chris even mentioned it a couple times, and she's right. It's weeding, weeding, weeding. And so it's just grabbing a five-gallon bucket, walking through there, and picking everything you can that's in the close to the plant material. I mean, everybody here has probably used a herbicide before. You don't want to have, you want to make sure it's not windy. You don't want to cause any drift. And just... You know, you might have to do a little bit of spot spraying on stuff that's too small to pick or you know is going to be big by the time you get back. It's just being careful and constantly weeding. And that, that property now is pretty easy to take care of weed-wise. Yeah, you say you're right, half a bucket? Yeah, I'm down to pretty much about a half a five-gallon bucket a week when I walk through there. It's not much. So we, we understand that one of the goals of these landscapes is to minimize and eventually eliminate, if possible, the use of harmful pesticides, including herbicides, but strategically we feel that, you know, you may need to use pre-emergence and selective herbicides. If you know when to use them and how to use them, then you can ultimately reduce your total need uh, to use chemicals over the life of the project. Um, okay, so we're going to watch another little video. Jimmy from Cherry Lake and we just want to show where some wildflowers want to reproduce or you know drop self sow a lot more than others. Coryops is one that definitely likes to spread itself around and we're going to show you here where it's taken over a few different beds. We have some Stokes Aster here which is kind of getting overtaken, some rattlesnake and then some swamp twin in the back. We're going to use the lawnmower and some hand pulling and we're going to clean this bed up and just show you how to keep it in range and and get a little bit of plant separation so that people can identify and it doesn't choke out some of your other plants that want to grow a little slower or a little lower. All right, so we're going to use the 80 volt electric mower today, but we're main, the main thing, it doesn't matter which mower you use, but just make sure you have it set on your highest setting and you'll want to come at it from two or three different directions as because how tall the material is, it's going to lay down. So you want to cut it up as much as you can. We're going to use it on the mulching setting just so that we can just incorporate that organic material back in our bed. So we'll show you an example in a minute about where we've already have done this and what it looks like as it's regenerating back. One good thing about mowing in this aspect is that the weeds are going to grow faster than the plant material typically. So after you've done this, within a week, it's going to start coming back, but the weeds are going to be a little bit taller, so they'll identify themselves easier. And it's a good time to grab a bucket and walk through and hand pick or spot treat however you decide to handle your weed problem. So these videos is our hope that as we produce more and more of them in collaboration with others in this, in this project, that we can help our existing industry professionals to learn a new set of skills so that they can be qualified and effective when they're, they're going out to Sunbridge and other projects like this to take care of these landscapes. Um, so again, it's really about a personal journey of, of taking these individuals through this process. And, you know, we, we've already started. I know, Jimmy, you've been working with Andreas now for a while, and, and how's he taken to it? Andreas has done great. He's, he came from the background of just basically mowing and blowing around the farm and a few other properties. He's spent 35 years with the company. So he he's, was well accustomed to the original thing. And when we started building the edge plantings that we have, at, you know, the trial gardens, he uh, started helping me and learning about it. And there's a little bit of a language barrier but he still really took to it. He understands now, I mean, he can identify all the seedlings as they're coming up. He's helping me teach other people. He's starting planting them at his own house. He already had a very well ornamental garden at home. His wife <laughs> keeps him busy there, but he, uh, he, they've started to really incorporate the natives though. 
and it's, it's fun to watch him learn, and um, he asks a lot of questions, which is great, and he shares. So as we're bringing pe- other crews in to work with us in the trial gardens on the farm, he's helping, you know, relay that information so that they can understand. Um, and, it, and it's, you know, he's so far been the best at doing it, and it really helps when he can help and relate to them and relate, speak to them in, t- in, their, in, a, in a language that they understand a little bit better, because sometimes when there is a language barrier, when you say weed, they, somebody might just shake their head yes, they heard weed, they didn't hear this isn't a weed, you know what I mean, and, and they're used to that. The problem with some of the natives are in the ornamental landscape, you're pulling and spraying them. So it really helps to have guys that you've trained and, and that are passionate about it because they can relay the message the best way and express it in a cultural or natural, you know, native way that really helps. So, you know, some of the skills that we feel are going to be really important for our landscape professionals to acquire that, you know, they may have to some degree already, but is less needed in the conventional landscape. So the big one to start with is plant identification. Uh, David, how much plant identification do our conventional landscapers have? Unfortunately, there's not a lot of need for it, you know, because pretty much you're just getting through and mowing it and, and trimming it, you know, so it doesn't really make much of a difference. And, you know, so I think it's that readjusting the skill sets. And, you know, I think there's some employees who are really going to enjoy the new landscape and the new way to maintain it, and other ones might not. But at the end, when you look at the uh, physical output that you do in a day as a landscape maintenance individual in the state of Florida, it's a, it's a grueling day. You know, it's not an easy day if what you're asking these guys to do, to bounce around on a mower all day long or carry a piece of two-cycle on your back or a, uh, an edger. So I don't think it's going to be too hard, but it's definitely going to be a big, you know, change. These individuals have done this for a very long time one way, so we've got to kind of stop and reprogram them. I think Jimmy's been working a lot on that. Yeah, I have, and I agree, and I, it is. And one thing about it is these landscapes mature, and the, and the, and the individual's train is now a gardener because they, they're going to have to have a little bit more of a horticultural um, education about it. They're going to enjoy their job more. They're not going to be sitting on a mower beating around all day. They're not going to be – I mean, it's going to be hot. We're in Florida. I mean, it's going to be warm. But – you're moving, you're not strapped to a piece of machinery, you're not listening to a two-cycle motor running all day. When I'm maintaining properties out at Westland, I'm using a battery-operated edger mainly just to keep the ground covers in shape. It takes a few minutes, and it's not loud at all. You don't have to, it's safer for the employee, you don't have to use hearing protection. And so, you know, you, you can be managing a, what the streets are doing, and if somebody's hollering for you, you can understand them. So yeah, I think it's gonna work out better. And, in, and uh, how much plant identification is needed? Is this the whole crew that needs to be able to identify plants? Can you work with just a lead man? I think in the beginning, the foreman especially, you, you know, we always got to work from the top down. And then they can work with their, their crew and start teaching everybody. I mean, it's, luckily with the, most of the natives, leaf shapes are pretty similar, right? I mean, what the parent is, what the seedling looks like, is just a smaller version. So it's just really attention to detail. Slow down a minute. We're not going 90 miles an hour. We're, you know, we don't have to hedge this whole property in 30 minutes. Just look at what you're looking at. Do you want it here or not? A weed's what's a plant where you don't want it, right? So some plants are going to move around. We pointed out some of the perennials today in the Aster family. They've got wings. They're going to blow wherever. So you might wind up with some stuff that even though it's native, it's not where you want it. So pull it, spray it, however you're going to deal with it. But if it's over here and we want it to keep self-sowing and we don't have to keep replace, replacing this perennial bed every year, Just let it drop, let it reseed itself. So in spring, we'll just cut back the older mature stuff and let the young ones grow for the new year. So when we're getting started, there's a whole set of considerations during establishment. And is it very different than a conventional landscape or are we back into some of the same principles? I feel that in in establishing the native landscape is exactly like ornamental to a point. We got to get them, they have to get rooted. Everything's coming for the most part from a nursery setup. Nursery setups are all based on X amount of gallons per day per plant. If, I mean, you can plant something, if you walk away from it, most of the plants are probably going to die. They're not going to be used to that much shock at one time. So we need to get them in the water, we need to get them acclimated. But one thing we do with the ground covers that we talked about a little bit with the groups I walked with, the uh, MP rotators, MP3s, they work great. Because on the ground covers, you don't want the net of them as much or the, the, the drip is only because if you have to do repairs and it's knitted over the top, it's kind of messy. And if you want to ed- edge that piece, we've, you know, that's something that we realized over in the plots. We used drip on the whole thing, which worked out, except for 
when we started to try to edge some of that mimosa back. There's a few couplers over there now because of it. You know, it's just it, how it worked, but we learned. So the MP3s are definitely working. With the uh, spot spitter you see on the right, that's mainly for the trees. Trees are definitely high water use when they're coming from a nursery. Some of them 50, 60 gallons a day, depending on how big a tree it is, the container size. So that's another one you certainly can't plant in the ground and walk away from and say it's going to rain tonight. So that's going to have to be a little bit more time. But if you use the spot spitters there, you see how that little piece of poly goes in on the top of it. Most of those spot spitters used in the industry, you can just pull that out, turn it upside down and plug it. So as you have different species of trees on that same poly line, you can start you know, weaning some of them off more than others. Some can have a few more heads than others. You can really play with the gallons per hours that way and pretty much cover a lot of your trees just on one line, only using one zone on your clock. And you can maintain that because you know, as you're acclimating your shrubs, your trees are gonna be the last ones off. So you just wanna make sure you take care of them. And that's, that's a good point is you wanna make sure the trees are on a separate zone. Yes. You know? So that as they, the water needs change, you can keep that That's in true. account. Yeah. So what, what was the main issue that you noticed on, on some of the other lots? So yeah, so after one of the biggest things, and it's, anybody that's in construction, landscape construction here deals with it to a point, right? Because you have painters, there's all this new construction happening. So every time you come to the job, somebody's either adjusted your clock or turned it off, right? So I mean, it's just how it is. Well, then also with natives, as you are trying to wean it back after a couple of weeks to a month, depending on what plant material you have, if you're not the ones that installed it, but you're the ones maintaining it, but those installers, they still have maybe a month guarantee or whatever for their homeowner or their, you know, the builder. They're coming back in like, who's messing with my clock? And they're dialing it all way back up. And then I'll come back in a couple of days behind them and I'm turning it all back down again because they're, they're, they're thinking everything still needs a lot of water. And I'm trying to be like, okay, it's time to start bringing it down. So you need to try to build a relationship if you can with your competitors to a point. Um, you know, sometimes it was funny on one of the properties, there's a maple tree and I'm just, it's poor things just stressing and stressing. And I had to bring the building superintendent out. I'm like, look, this is overwatering a maple tree. You guys are about to drown a tree that lives almost at the edge of a swamp. So please just <laughs> stop pouring water to it. Have your contractor, your other vendors stop adding water. And it's just something that happens. So we talked a lot about weeding. Um, it's, uh, it's part of, of establishing these landscapes and, and one of the things we're just going to have to contend with. Um, what are some of the skills we need to teach our guys? Plant identification. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be the first thing, right? You know, identifying what is a weed and, well, everything's a weed if it's not where you want right. it. So, it, you know, it, educating them on what this landscape is and what you want where and, you know, how it wants to be and say, hey, if it's not where it should be, take it out. I think, too, you know, if we get individuals to understand kind of the principles of the way weeds grow, you know, weeds are in a, in a bank of the soil. So there's lots of weed seeds that are buried in there, and every time you pull a weed, now you're disrupting the bank and you're starting all over again. So if you can kind of teach some of the principles behind, hey, how do we control weeds? We get a sterile layer on top of the soil by making sure that we, if we see a single weed by itself, we could treat it with some uh, you know, um, herbicide by itself. We do better than by pulling it. And you shake all those weed seeds off. You know, so kind of teach people the principles behind how are these weeds really spreading and help to you know, inform. Well, and then back to the pre-emergent is having a nice pre-emergent layer down to help keep the weeds from coming up to begin with and making sure your mulch layer is the right thickness as well. And, you know, I always feel, too, is when you're weeding, it's better to have a bucket without holes in the bottom and just <laughs> keep putting those weeds straight up, straight in the bucket. I always, you know, it just makes me kind of cringe when you see a guy with a big handful of weeds walking around. He's happy, but he's shaking seeds all through the property. And it's like, all right, you know. Could have solved that with a five-gallon bucket. Are you so, talking about me? No. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then you want to get these things before they, they go to seed. Right. You if try you to get them before they seed. I mean, you, when you're on these properties, once some, you know, if you're visiting a properties, typically one day a week. And so, it's, you know, in Florida, a week can grow fast in a week. So if you miss that guy when he's little, when you come back, more than likely he's already going to bloom or have seeds on him the next time you're here. So you just really need to try to make sure you get as much as you can every time you're there. Okay, so proper pruning. Now, hopefully, if we got the right plants in the right place with the right spacing, it's minimal. But what do we need to know here? So in this picture, we, we used a couple different examples. Um, the one with the coffee, 
on my left, I'm sure it's your left too, right? So on your left there, the coffee is just showing that we put it in the right spot. It's going to grow up to about the base of those windows. Occasionally, you might have the wild sprout that comes up. You can catch them with your clippers while you're weeding with your bucket, right? It'll fit right in the bucket. <laughs> that hedge to the right of that corner there, that's a viburnum hedge and a little bit of trinette at the end. That one, you're going to be out there with the gas shears if you want it to stay sharp once a week, twice, you know, twice a month anyways, to keep what most uh, homeowners would like. So it, it just, it's, it's a good symbol there of how much the maintenance is going to go down. On the right is we're just using some grass, and grasses can be a hedge as long as what you're hiding behind it can um, stand to be exposed when you have to cut it back. You know, the native grasses want to be cut back, emulate fire, so you can, you'll cut it down close to the ground the right way. I mean, that little vase is something that the guys picked up, and it really should be cut closer to the ground. Um, and depending on the environment, you might even be able to hopefully use that, the leftover grass as mulch. It just depends on, you know, what's the tolerance and where you're working, front yard or backyard, and how the HOA is. But yeah, that's what we're showing here. This is where we're going to maybe have a lot of differences with a conventional landscape, right? Conventional, plant, conventional landscape plants, pretty static, not a whole lot of change throughout the year. Um, what are your... What are your considerations when dealing with these plants that want to reseed, that want to, that want to spread? So here, this one, th these slides represent the one with the tropical sage on the left. It's showing you that I didn't really want to get the big picture because the rest of it, unfortunately, the hurricane beat up so bad. But what it's showing you is that there's a mul that, and that mulch behind that one tropical sage is blooming is a whole bed of tropical sage. And what's happened is, is right between the swamp twin there below it, that's just where there's bare dirt. So all the seeds that fell in that area, they all germinated. They were exposed to sunlight, and that many just come up in just a matter of a few weeks. Underneath that mulch, up in the, up in the regular planting, there's hardly any up there at all. So it's just showing that if you let it have seed, you know, without being mulch, it's gonna, they're going to you know, germinate. Same thing over to the next middle slide. It's just showing that there's some coreopsis that was actually planted there before we started that project, and it's found its way back to the top, just where the mulch is getting sparse. On the right side, you have coreopsis surrounding a couple young blanket flower. That's an area we want the blanket flower to actually grow. This is where Andres being trained and learning. He's like, he identified that. He's like, hey, we got some blanket flower right here. So he didn't kill it. He didn't pull it, which was great. And we're just going to go ahead and pull some more of that coreopsis away from it and let that just be a splash of year-round color because one great thing about blanket flower is it pretty much can bloom all year. And, you know, it'll help make up for that coreopsis when it's down. Yeah, and then what I like about this picture is you can see just how the uh, seedlings emerging, they really look exactly like the parent. Yes. So, you know, it's not too complicated. You know, you can see that. So this is a more mature coreopsis. And then here you have an emerging coreopsis. So we can train our, our, our gardeners to, to start to identify these, uh, these plants as they're coming up so they don't mistake them for spurge or something that you do want to get out of there. Right. Um, so um, we need our landscapers to become plant doctors. Is that, is that hard to do? David, what do you think? I mean, I, would, I think when you look at the alternatives, it's, it's pretty easy. You know, what would you rather spend your day? I think the, the day that Jimmy describes, you know, picking weeds in a five-gallon bucket and doing some hand trimming or bouncing across a yard on a, on a mower, and the, you know, or, the, or have a two piece of two-cycle. So I think that the, it's going to be a, an easy change in the sense, what would you rather do? But it's going to be a lot of training because I don't think it's intuitive. I think that the new landscaper doing native plants is going to have to have a lot more plant identification, going to understand the why behind what they're doing. So it's going to be a retooling. So our current uh, landscape professionals, when they see uh, plants that started to feel a little, a little stressed, what, what are they going to think? More water <laughs> every time. <laughs> more water? Usually, right? That seems like everybody's response when something looks bad is it needs more water. It needs a lot of fertilizer. Um, and this is just in a situation in a planting that we have that actually just through the way the soils were working in that area and the water runoff from a hill was just it was the tropical sage on the right side is just getting way too much water and it's just it's not happy. The one on the left is just it's what it should look like. So, I mean, that's for us is just that we need to fix the situation. And that's what we need to teach our guys is how to fix situations, how to recognize situations need to be fixed. How should a plant look when it's healthy? And 
it'll come with time. As you know, we all learn in horticulture. One thing about it, it's a great on-the-job training job. I mean, I've, that's the way I grew up through it. The way I grew up through a boar culture. So it's a great way to learn. The guys will pick up on it quick, and the gals. It's not going to be something that we can't teach them. And, you know, the general idea is that we do want our landscapers who are working in the landscape to be paying attention, right? To, to not only pay attention to the detail of what they're looking at, but to try to understand the landscape system as a whole. You know, like you, you were pointing out in this earlier slide, you know, yes, we can first diagnose that this isn't too much, uh, too little water, it's actually too much water. But then we can look further and we can see how the water is running down, running down the slope, and I don't have the picture to show you that, but to, to kind of trace it back up to uh, its root cause. Well, yeah, too, in that situation, it's the soil is part of the issue because that there's a pocket there where there's some clay mixed in that's causing it to hold the soil, the hold the water. So it's, it's, you know, it's identify the plant, identify is it a soil issue, is it a runoff issue, what is the root cause that is the issue here, and then fix that. Don't just turn more water on or add more fertilizer because if you add more fertilizer to a native, it's going to shut it down, right? Because it doesn't want it. Doesn't want fertilizer. So, Jimmy, what was the uh, what was the discovery here on this Simpson stopper? That's Simpson stopper. I showed it to some of the groups that were with me today. That was easy. Um, if you, uh, that was the first house on lot 23 we walked this morning, over the and then we had the townhomes being built beside that. Well, it's typical any time that you know a truck's coming to unload material. He pulls up. He parks. He doesn't want his AC to be turned off, so he's leaving that truck idling. So that's just exhaust damage. Um, I've seen it a lot in the theme parks. Anybody that works in theme parks, you'll can identify it pretty regular as construction's done at night there, so they don't mind turning, leaving their trucks running at night. And they'll do the same thing to your hedges in that, in that atmosphere. And the same thing happens in regular construction and home residential areas. So what we did is we're leaving that. It's starting to flush out now. We'll figure out what's going to be left, cut it out. Send some, send some stopper is a great plant, and it'll come back out of it this spring and just fill back in. So it's, it's, it would be, it's better than just... Go mow, go and blow guys, pull up and say, you know what, hey, your tree's dead, we need to replace it. And then all of a sudden the homeowner just bought another 30 gallon plus labor of putting in a shrub when really all it needed was a pruning. So ultimately what we're looking for are, are gardeners versus landscapers. And, and this is maybe the joy and, and the, the love of, of the job if we can, you know, really recruit and, and inspire some of our professionals uh, like Andreas is getting excited um, and, and going beyond the plants is really to recognize the life cycles that are occurring and the relationships between the pollinators and, and the plants out there. And uh, it's something that I think many in this room are, are very passionate about. You guys have caught, you know, the, the feeling, you know, and the excitement that comes from becoming aware of these relationships. And there's no reason why our landscapers can't also, you know, catch that, that feeling. I agree, and this, these, this set of slides all came from our farm, and those of you, I'm pretty sure everybody's pretty familiar with the monarch caterpillar. It's chrysalis, and have you ever seen one that's emerging right there on, in the morning? So it's kind of like on a conventional landscape, you know, it's one of these things that we've got to teach our guys. It's like you don't go to somebody's house and start eating all the fruit off their fruit tree, right? Because you get a homeowner's call, they're pretty upset. Hey, your guy just ate all my fruit. So it's the same thing with this. If we go in there and the guys aren't paying attention to where the habitat that we created may be housing some things at the present time, we don't need to go in there and cut out all their chrysalises because the monarchs just finished up eating all the, the milkweeds. So they went over there 9 to 15 feet and they crawled up something high and made a chrysalis. That's not the time to go in there and start clear-cutting things back. Sure, it's a front yard. We want to keep it clean, but, you know, keep your eyes open. Learn what the crystals look like. There's different shapes for the, the different caterpillars and butterflies, um, and give them a time to go ahead and do their evolution, and then we can cut it back. And it's just, you know, we talked about it a lot in here. It's just education of the people that are going to be your neighbors and in the environment. So. So we are working on this uh, video maintenance series. Uh, we are going to be adding videos as we go because we want to we want to just kind of build this um, this uh, library over time. Uh, our first uh, batch of eleven videos are posted, and uh, we've got about twenty five or thirty more that that we're just editing and, and wrapping up. So we're going to be adding more and more 
All of this is, is intended to be, to be utilized freely by anyone who can find value in it, whether it's a landscape maintenance company that wants to start training their professionals as we are gonna be doing at Cherry Lake, um, or maybe homeowners, maybe homeowners that moved into a beautiful home at Sunbridge and decide they wanna tackle this themselves. We need to put the resources out there. Um, we don't think it's a, it's, it's a mountain to climb. It definitely requires a little bit of attention and commitment to, to train, but um, the basic skills can be taught and you know, that's what we're hoping to do is to build up a core and, and to help the industry you know, make that transition. Maybe you know, take, take landscapers, turn them into gardeners, give them a job that they may find more meaningful. And, and maybe even ultimately can be more financially rewarding as well. Um, and I think that might be a good question, you know, to wrap up with is, is does, what is the cost here? Is this more expensive? Is this less expensive? How does this compare to conventional maintenance? I think intuitively you feel like it should be less, but I think we you know, have so much to learn about how all this process is going to come together. You know, I think the Jimmy can speak to a lot of the that, that retooling and then recalibrating, I think you're doing some work on figuring out exactly what the cost is. It is. I mean, the thing is, you know, you're going to be, we talked about it, the mulch. So most of the property is going to be pine straw. So there's at least two applications a year of pine straw. So you get your labor involved there. Um, and then it's going to depend on the homeowner a little bit as well on how, how much more are they going to want to do. Do they want to keep going, covering ground covers, edging ground covers? I mean, there's a little bit of stuff where you just in weeding. I mean, the initial first year or two, I think it's going to take a little bit more time because we are spending some time weeding. And until that seed bank, you get through that first initial seed bank on a property. And some properties are great and other properties are, you know, Brooke spoke, spoke brilliantly talking about the, the, the urban soil the other day because you don't know where it's coming from. You can get one property that somebody just skimmed the top four inches off of something. You get the whole seed bank on one property. And then the next one, you get the bottom of the pond and you don't have anything in there. So it's, you know, we can, I can even see that through some of the houses at Westland where, you know, I have a frog fruit patch. I'm not dealing with any sedge at all. And then we plant over here again and I got it everywhere. So it's really hard at first, I think, till we nail down and get a little bit more time in to really give a true cost on it. I don't see it costing more by any means. I mean, we definitely aren't driving the big truck. I mean, I'm doing it with a Toyota Tacoma and an extra, you know, myself and one person. So it's working. It's just, it's going to take time to figure out real costs. Yeah, I think your equipment's going to be less. You'll have a smaller truck, maybe a smaller trailer, definitely a smaller trailer, if a trailer at all. Right. Um, you're going to have a higher cost, you know, on the labor side, just intuitively thinking that, you know, you want people to be more educated, so they're going to have more value. But I, I definitely think over time we'll find that there will be less cost to it, and the people that are going to be doing it will be happier and a higher level individual. No, I agree. And I think when I look at the, the whole puzzle, you know, it gives us a, an opportunity to reinvent something that's kind of not working well for anybody. So if we look at it from that perspective, we've got to change. You know, if you go to the Midwest, they, they don't have this kind of water supply. We know we won't have this water supply forever. So when I look at it going forward, we're, we, kind of, we have to change. It's not like we're really given much option. So we might as well embrace it and say, okay, this is what we need to deal with and figure out how to, how to retool and, and end up in a better place. But I don't think what we're doing right now is sustainable for very much longer when you look at, uh, you know, the amount of water that we're pumping out of the ground versus what's probably down there, so. Well, great, so uh, we just wanted to share kind of some of our thoughts on, on how the maintenance is gonna go, but I think we have time for some questions and love to, to hear from you guys.